Hi guys, welcome to Learn Electronics Repair. I'm going to tackle a big topic now. This is not going to be one video, it's going to be two or three, but I'm going to try and publish these over the next few days. So let's get this one through, let's do the whole thing in a few chunks, and hopefully at the end of this video, you will be able to read and understand schematics. I'm not saying you'll be an expert at this, there will be times when you are still puzzled by the operation of a circuit, but this is a good place to start. So, first off, the obvious question, what is a schematic? Well, a schematic is a diagram, a representation of a circuit. It's not the same thing as a physical layout of a circuit on a circuit board, it's more a diagram that shows how components are interconnected rather than how they are placed in relation to each other. On the screen behind me, you can see a schematic. This is, in fact, from an audio mixer. And if we have a look, we will see our schematic is made up of symbols and lines. The symbols represent components. So each of these symbols is a component. The different symbols are different types of components and also marked on and around them. You'll see some numbers. So, for example, we see here R10A. I'll show you what all these symbols mean at the moment, but in fact, this one is a resistor. R, and the 10A refers to the position of that component on the circuit board. So if you look on the circuit board, you will see often in the silk screen printed on there, the locations of the components with the numbers. So these numbers reference the location on the circuit board. Let me show you, it makes it much easier. Here we have a typical circuit board, and you will see on the silk screen, that's the white writing on here, we have numbers and letters printed. So for example, here we have R108 through to R111, pointing to these components here. We have some more down the side, R160, and not in order particularly, 164, 321, 158, and they refer to the components nearby. You can usually work out by the fact there are seven numbers there and there are seven components there. So in order, R161, 162, 164, 158, and so on. We will find that some components have different letters. So C, this, that, and the other. R, this, that, and the other. These ones are marked IC. So IC401, IC400, okay? These letters and numbers are not the value of the components. These are the reference. This is the number we see on the schematic against that component. And this is to help you identify the components on the circuit board. During this video, we will learn to understand the symbols, what symbols represent what components, and the common lettering systems that are used as well. It's not always possible to identify a component by the lettering system, but it often is. Here is another circuit board. This is being salvaged for some parts, but it's another good example. So, again, we have a similar lettering and numbering system, R63, C83, D23, D22. These Q, Q8, there's another Q something there, D21, and so on. Some things like this wire are marked as PG. There's a reason for that also. During this video, you will learn how to identify components by the lettering system. You often can. So certain letters are used for certain types of components very often. We will learn that and how to recognize the symbols on the schematic. This is our first step in understanding schematics. The symbols are like the letters of the alphabet. You have to understand the alphabet before you can understand the words, okay? So in this video, part one, we're going to look at symbols. In addition to symbols on our schematic, you see we have lines. These are connections. These are wires or tracks on a printed circuit board. These are connections between the components. You will also notice that some of these lines have names, prefab1, disp1, disp2, and so on. You can see there are names on some of these lines. 
And if we look at some other schematics, you will see that some look quite different from this one. So for example, this contains digital and analog circuitry. It looks different, but this is a schematic again. This schematic contains some other features that we'll learn about. For example, some of these names have lines over the top of them. Okay, well by the side in that case, but the writing is sideways. So we have these things on our schematic. We have more symbols we can learn. And this is another schematic. The last one I will show you as an example. This represents part of the circuitry on the motherboard. And again, you can see we have a similar thing, but now we have arrows on the lines. We have more labels on the symbols. And this is a different type of layout. You can see this type of schematic does not consist of a lot of lines interconnecting all the components. It's laid out in a different way. So all of these things we're going to learn about in part one, this part. Part two, we will look at the way components are connected and start to understand the building blocks of the circuit. If you like, if this part is the alphabet of schematics, the second part will be learning the vocabulary of schematics. In this video, I'm going to use the method I normally use, which is pen and paper. So no fancy animated or static graphics on this, just pen and paper, the old fashioned way, okay? So first of all, we need to learn the alphabet. We need to learn the symbols. There are probably hundreds, if not thousands of symbols used in schematics, and you will not learn all of them. I don't know all of them. But there are certain ones that you come across much more often than others. So some of the most common symbols we need to know. One symbol represents one electronic component. And electronic components broadly fall into two classes. Passive components and active components. The passive components consist of resistors. Capacitors and inductors plus a type of an inductor called transformers. And then there are a number of components that are not exactly these classic passive components, but they kind of fall in the same group. So we have, for example, fuses, switches, relays, batteries, power sources and nodes. We'll put them on here. Power sources and nodes, okay? So let's start with resistors. These are a very common type of component. We find them on basically every schematic. And the symbol for a resistor actually has two different variations. We get this variation. And we get this variation. They're interchangeable. You can use either of them as you wish. And the symbol doesn't have to be horizontally in the schematic like this. It could be this way around. And the same for this type. So the orientation of the symbol doesn't matter. These are all resistors. After the basic resistor, we get a whole variety of specialized ones, if you like. And all of the specialized ones are based on either of these symbols. And the symbol is interchangeable. So I'll show you with the next type. But after that, we'll just stick with one of these. But bear in mind, we can use either basis for all of these symbols. So the next one we'll use is variable resistor. I won't write the word resistor out again, otherwise I'd write it a lot of times here. But a variable resistor symbol can be like this, or it can be like this. And to show it's variable, we have the slider or the track if you like, okay? This can be a rotary variable resistor, it can be a slider variable resistor, it can be either of them. The variable resistor is also known as a potentiometer, that's another term for this. 
there is actually a difference. A potentiometer is wired in such a way that it uses all three pins. Effectively, a voltage on one pin or a signal, not on the other, or ground on the other, and the slider will effectively move from one to the other. And we can have a variable resistor. It's the same component, wired a different way. And the variable resistor, we just use two pins, one end of the track and the slider. So the variable resistor can also be drawn like this. And this is using one end of the carbon track that forms a variable resistor and the slider. Okay, likewise it could be drawn like that. And also likewise, it could be drawn vertically, okay? So those are resistors and variable resistors. Now, as I mentioned, we have a number of specialized resistors, if you like. And I will just use the zigzag symbol, but it could always be the other one, okay? So another type of resistor, which you don't find very much, and you'll find this, if at all, in vintage equipment, is a tapped resistor. Like so, where effectively it's like a variable resistor but fixed in a certain position, and you can have more than one tap, like so, for example. So, this is a tapped resistor. This is one you're very unlikely to come across these days unless you're working on very old equipment. We also have some specialized resistors, if you like. So, we have the varistor sometimes also called a voltage dependent resistor or an MOV which stands for metal oxide varistor this is a type of resistor that changes its value its resistance with voltage okay and there's a similar one if you like which is the thermistor and this one is a resistor that changes its value with temperature the varistor has a symbol that looks like this. And again, we can use the zigzag or the box with the same line drawn through it. So these terms are all synonymous with each other. And this is the symbol. The thermistor is similar, so don't mistake them. The thermistor symbol is this okay now with the thermistor there are two main varieties we have thermistors that increase in resistance with temperature and ones that decrease resistance with temperature and they both have different uses in circuits now the symbol for both types is the same but often in the schematic you can tell which was which because by them you will either see NTC or PTC written on the schematic. NTC is a negative temperature coefficient, which means that as the temperature increases, the value decreases, becomes more negative with temperature, if you like, yeah? And the PTC becomes higher resistance, more positive resistance with temperature. However you like to think about it, these decrease in resistance as they get hotter and these increase in resistance as they get hotter there's also a variation on the variable resistor called a preset or trimmer potentiometer or trimmer pot these are the little ones you find on circuit boards that you adjust with a screwdriver they're not meant to be continually adjusted by the operator they are meant for setting the circuit up and then you leave them in the position they are set they have a very similar symbol to this one, actually. And of course, there are the two variants. So we have this type with, looks like a long letter T through it. And of course, we can have that with the square box as well. And we have another variant, again, with both the square box or the zigzag. And this is like so. Or for that matter, and I'll draw this one square, like so. I like to think of this as looking like a letter T, and this component is usually called a trimmer, or a trimmer pot. There's one other type, actually, which comes to mind, and that is the LDR. So this is a resistor that changes its value with light. 
you shine a light on and it changes resistance. Normally they become lower in resistance. So these are not common components. They're really obsolete now. We used these a lot in the 1970s and little projects we could make where effectively you shone a light on and it sounded a buzzer or something similar. All things that are a lot of fun to school kids, basically. The LDR has this symbol. And yes, it can be the other way. And an interesting thing about this symbol is the use of these arrows pointing inwards. This is a common thing in schematics and it's used in various components. So any symbol you see which has arrows pointing in towards it like this is light dependent or light sensitive okay so you can get photodiodes phototransistors and they will all use phototriax is another one phototyristors all these photosensitive components the symbol will be different but in common with each other they will have these arrows pointing inwards the direction of the arrows is not important this symbol could just as easily be like so or from this side whichever okay and there are variations on all of these symbols so for example you'll sometimes see the light dependent resistor like so without the circle around it you do find variations these components have been around for decades and things symbols if you like have come in and out of fashion basically during that time so yes you will find variations but really once you know the symbol it shouldn't be too difficult to work out what that one is okay or even this one yeah so that's all of the resistor types i can think of maybe there are more but i'm not certain i know of them okay so let's have a look now at the next common passive component, which is capacitors. With capacitors, there are probably less symbols and variants that you are likely to see, but there are some. Capacitors generally come into three types. So you have fixed, non-polarized capacitors. We have polarized. These are your electrolytic capacitors and we have variable. These are the main ones. Variable capacitors, you only find these in radio frequency circuits, really. Both the fixed and polarized capacitors are fixed capacitors. They have a fixed value. The main difference is that these have a positive and negative terminal and must be connected the correct way around, and these don't. So your basic symbol for a capacitor is this, okay? Again, it could be horizontal it's this and this is your fixed non-polarized capacitor we then have the polarized ones so these are your electrolytic and polymer and similar capacitors now these ones they do have variations this is a symbol i normally use and this end is the positive on the schematics sometimes you will see the plus sign and sometimes you will not but there are a number of variants on this. In particular, the United States variant, the very common one, is this. Okay? And again, this end is a positive. And likewise, you may or may not see the plus sign on the schematic on the symbol. There are a few older versions of this. In particular, this one you may well come across on old schematics. Okay, again, this is the positive. And a similar in between, if you like, is the non-polarized electrolytic capacitors. These have a symbol like this. So it's similar to this one. It has the thicker line compared to that one. And by the way, I will just mention, these can be also drawn with the 
bar filled in, okay. Like so. But again, this is the polarized. These two are the non-polarized. These are electrolytic capacitors, but as I say, they don't have a plus and minus. You find these particularly in audio crossover circuits and that sort of thing. So those are the symbols you are most likely to come across. If you're working on radio frequency circuits, particularly vintage radio, you will find variable capacitors. There are some variants again. I won't show all of them, but this is a variable capacitor. That looks similar to the variable resistor. This arrow through the diagonal arrow suggests something is variable, okay? Whether it's a resistor or a capacitor, it uses the same method. So if you start to realize these things, it becomes very easy to analyze these symbols to what they are. It'll be no surprise then that the trimmer capacitor, this is a preset variable one, will have the T like so, okay? There is an unusual variant of this, by the way. I'll just show it to you in case you ever come across this one. And that's that symbol, variable capacitor. This is obsolete, I would say, but you may come across it, so now you've seen it. If you remember it, you'll know what it is. And we can get what I'll call ganged or dual capacitors or even triple variable capacitors. So you get symbols like this where we have two capacitors together, variable. Variable. And then we have a dotted line. So between the two wipers, we have a dotted line like so. That tells you that these are ganged. So they basically both adjust together, okay? They don't adjust separately, they adjust together. That's what's called ganged. Okay, and it will come as no surprise now, we were talking about resistors, that you can get ganged resistors. These are, for example, like your stereo controls on an amplifier. So you have two variable resistors on the same shaft. They vary at the same time. And the symbol for that one is the same as this, really. So you have your two variables, and the dotted line shows they're ganged together. They are mechanically interconnected. Or for that matter, Okay, but this is a less common way of doing it. Another way of doing this, and you may see this on capacitors, resistors, and inductors for that matter, is they will use the markings on the schematic, the component reference. So you'll see something like, we'll use a resistor, but it could just as well be a capacitor. VR2A, for example, variable resistor 2A, VR2B. And this AB business tells you this is both parts of VR2, A and B. And they don't need to be next to each other on the schematic. They could be completely different positions on the schematic, but from this reference, component reference number, and you can imagine here we could have like uh, VC1A, VC1B, rather than showing this ganged thing, okay? So that's another way of doing that. But you'll be happy to know that that's pretty much all we need to do with capacitor symbols. And you can see now, I hope, the correlation between these types of symbols, between resistors, capacitors. And the next one we're going to do is inductors. And you will see this again. And while we're doing this, we will look at the close related transformers. There are many, many variations on these symbols again, but the first thing I will mention is the basis of the symbol. Just like the resistor, we had the zigzag, or we had the box as the base of the symbol. 
with inductors, we have four variants. Would you believe it? Okay. So we have this one which is an inductor. We also have this one, which is the one I tend to use, an inductor. We also have a box like the resistor, but filled in. Okay, a filled box. That's an inductor. And we have, I've never particularly seen this one, but it exists, it's out there. We have the box with the letter L in, L being the symbol for inductance, okay? So we have those four bases of our symbols, and these are interchangeable, okay? So this basis can be used for many of the other symbols. They're all interchangeable. I'll show you what I mean. With an inductor, usually the coil, the winding is wrapped around some sort of former. Those formers generally are either solid iron, or they are ferrite, which is like a metal or iron oxide mixed with a resin or similar type solution. It could be a ceramic type, actually. So often the symbol will also tell us the type of core that the coil is wrapped around. So you will see, for example, this one with two solid lines. This is an iron core. And you will see the same with a dotted line. This is a ferrite core. Okay, this is the grey black substance you often see coils wrapped around basically. Iron, usually in transformers, you can recognize it. It's sheets of iron, okay? As I mentioned, all four of these can be like this. So I'll just draw one in, just, but I'm sure you get the gist of what I'm saying. So you can just as easily have this type of symbol with the iron or with the ferrite, okay? What other inductors do we have? Well, we have variable ones. There's a few symbols for this, but this is the same basis as those variable capacitors and variable resistors. So this should come. There's no surprise. In fact, you could probably draw these now without me even showing you what they are. So a variable inductor. I'll draw this type. Okay. Diagonal arrow through it. Yeah. Like the capacitor, like the resistor. Preset. Or a trimmer. Like the T through it. The same as a resistor, same as a capacitor. And you can combine all this so you can have a variable inductor with a ferrite core. Yeah. And any other combination thereof. There is another way to draw variable ones, and really one of them looks a bit like that strange variable capacitor we had, and one looks much more like a variable resistor. So we can have this. I'll use this type this time. Doesn't matter. We can have this. Okay. We can have this. This is rather like that capacitor we saw. Remember the one like that? Yeah. This uncommon. I can't say I've ever particularly seen that one, but if you ever see it, that's what it actually is. And we can have tapped inductors. So like the tapped resistors that we had, a fixed tap, for example, there. So effectively, the position of the tap should give you an idea of the ratio of voltages it's towards this end. So if that is 50 volts, that might be a 10 volt tap, okay? I'm not saying it always does represent where it is on the winding, but it could do. And those are your inductors, really. And I'm hopefully you've seen a pattern with all this now, okay? Transformers. Transformers are just more than one winding on a former. This is a transformer. Okay. This is a transformer with two secondaries. Okay. And by the way, notice I didn't put the solid lines between. It's kind of optional. Sometimes they're not there at all. Okay. This is a 
transformer with a center tapped secondary winding. Yeah. And one other thing I'll mention about transformer symbols is this. You'll see this, you'll see this definitely. So for example, in this case two coils driving one coil no reason why we can't do that and you will see this why not put it there these dots represent the phase so they're saying that when this end of the winding is in the positive half cycle AC yeah that this induced voltage will also be in the positive half cycle at this end uh, but when this winding is inducing voltage into this one, when this end is positive, the positive is at that end. So effectively, this one is passing the AC through, just increasing the voltage or decreasing the voltage. Okay, this one is passing the voltage through and increasing or decreasing, but it's also inverting the phase. So that's what those are. They represent the phase. There are loads of esoteric, weird and wonderful inductor and transformer symbols, but I don't think you'll come across them. If you do, you'll certainly know they're inductors or they are transformers, and you can go and look up the symbols. Yeah. But there's one more I will draw, because you may see this. This is a... motor winding three phases okay with the center tap you may see that so i think we'll put that one in and we'll call that complete okay so that's inductors now you may think that resistors capacitors inductors that's the three types of passive components and to some extent you're correct but there are other components you will find on schematics with symbols that although not exactly passive components they are not active components either let's look at these other passive components then so crystals and resonators symbol for a crystal is this one yeah resonator is this one again usually this is actually drawn horizontally. In fact, I'll draw it a bit bigger so it's more clear. Okay. Usually this is connected to ground, by the way. And it may say ground on it. And then we have another one, very similar. Oops, almost missed that capacitor there, actually, okay. Which is that one. So, these two are resonators, and this one is a crystal. Those are the symbols of those ones. Also, in these group of passive components, we have fuses. So, fuse is either like that, or it's like this. That's a fuse, often marked on the schematic with the value of the fuse. Similar, these will often be marked with the frequency of the crystal. One megahertz. But they don't have to be. Yeah, but usually they are marked at least with the value. We have batteries. That's a single cell battery. Probably better to call the cell because a battery, by definition, is more than one cell. Okay. Before somebody mentions that, I already got there first. This is the positive end. So these are battery. And you'll often find on schematics voltage and current sources, constant current sources. So a voltage source. 
And these are normal schematics where they're trying to teach the principle of the circuit rather than an actual schematic of a device, okay? But the voltage source, like so, plus minus. And of course, AC, yeah, AC voltage source, and the constant currents. Similar. The arrow donates the direction of the current flow, so it could be either way, okay, but it's donating the direction of current flow. And you will sometimes also see this one with an arrow by the side of it. Quite often with a current source, by the symbol, it would tell you what the current is. 50 milliamps, for example, okay? And the same with the voltage source, it may tell you the voltage. So those are the other passive component symbols that we're likely to come across. Let's talk now about switches and relays. So with switches, the symbol is very simple and there are a number of variations and these variations will depend on how many switch positions there are, one position, two, three, six, and how many poles in the switch there are. So a simple basic switch is this symbol. But if it's a push button switch in particular, it could be this symbol, okay? So those are switches. And we find the various types of contacts, if you like. So this one is a single pole double throw. It has two positions, okay? And this is abbreviated to SP, single pole, DT, double throw. This is a single pole, single throw. It has one active position. The other one is just open circuit. Single pole, single throw. You will find a double pole, double throw. So this is this type of switch. Okay, and the two are ganged together, so often you'll find the dashed line like we were looking at before with ganged variable resistors and ganged variable capacitors. So that is in fact a double pole, double throw. And we can get all sorts of different ones, you know, we can have a uh, single pole three-way, SP3 throw usually, okay. So those are your switch symbols. There's many varieties of symbol as there are of switches, but these are all switches, so it's easy to recognize them. And the relay is very similar to this. So with the relay, we have the coil. Usually representing the core of the relay. And then we have the contact. So for example, we can have like this. This would represent a single pole double throw. So it's SP double throw. And this represents the normally closed contacts. So you'll often see on the schematic NC with a relay or NO. This doesn't mean no contact, it means normally closed when referring to a relay and normally open. So you can gather from this that when the relay is not energized, that contact is closed, this one is open. That's what it means by normal. It means when the relay is not powered. And save me drawing the whole thing again. We can just put some more onto this one, so. We now have a double pole, double throw, really. And again, you can see the normally closed position is here, normally open. There are, of course, lots of variations on these symbols for switches and relays. But given the information you have here, you should be able to work out what is happening on any schematic you find that has these components. 
The final topic for this part of the video is nodes. Nodes are not electronic components. They are symbols on a schematic that tell you where certain components and the lines which are tracks on the schematic are connected to. So I give you a good example. We have, for example, on a schematic, a resistor, a capacitor. And these are connected to a line on the schematic. That tells us this end of each component is connected together. Now this may be connected to a node. Typical would be ground. So if we see this symbol, it tells us this track, this end of each of these components is connected to ground or earth, if you like. There are other symbols similar to this, so you find variations. For example, you will find this one used as ground. You will find this one used as ground. They're all synonymous with each other. You'll also find another slight variation on this. You may find this quite often, which is this one. This is normally what is called hot ground. So this is a ground, a zero volts reference for your circuit, but it's not a safety ground. This is typical in power supplies. This would be connected to the negative end of the large smoothing capacitor and hence via the bridge rectifier to the mains. So those are all ground symbols. These are safety ground symbols. In some circuits, you may find more than one ground. So the power supply may have a ground. And for example, the audio circuits and amplifier may have a separate ground. So you will sometimes find symbols like this one. A. And that's an analog or audio ground. And you will find in the same circuit probably a normal ground as well. And normally the two are connected together in some way via a low value resistor or a capacitor even. But you will find that. So when you see this, it tells you that every time you see this symbol on the schematic somewhere else, those points are connected to each other. And in other parts of the circuit, you may find, for example, the hot ground symbol. Then you may have this here, obviously not connected to that, I will say. And you know, those points are connected together. So this is what nodes are. It's just a way to show things that are connected to each other without drawing tracks all over the schematic like a rat's nest. All the common nodes you will find are going to positive supplies. So this, for instance, VCC or five volts is telling you that that point is connected to five volts a very common way you will see this used i'll just give you an example we may have an integrated circuit that does something in out one out two and from the bottom you will see something like that which tells you this is ground for example pin four this might be pin one two three and something like this, VCC, and this may be, for example, pin eight. So you'll see those on schematics, and that's what they are, they're nodes. Of course, they may be drawn differently. Okay, so now we have all of the passive components and pseudo-passive components symbols. Part two, we'll look at all the active components that we're likely to come across. And then we will have really the alphabet of schematics. We will know all of the symbols that we're likely to find. Part three then is, as I said, the vocabulary of schematics. This is how these things join together, how to understand the circuits, how to read them. Okay, hope you enjoyed that part one. Part two, I think tomorrow, and I'll see you all then. Ciao for now, guys.